we have seen his star in the east and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. So they said to him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not the least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people of Israel. Then Herod, when he had secretly called the wise men, determined from them what time the star appeared. Wait for the next Then Herod, when he had secretly called the wise men, determined from them what time the star appeared. <laughs> Wouldn't that? All right, let's get focused. <laughs> when they heard the king, they departed, and behold, the star which they had seen in the east went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. And when they saw the star, they rejoiced to be seen with great joy. And when they had come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary his mother and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented gifts to him, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Then he divinely warned in a dream that they should not return to Herod. They departed for their own country and other way. Amen. God's, we, we know from there God's preservation of baby Jesus. Let's take our hymn books now and turn to hymn number 255 before the choir comes to share in song, A King Has Come. So choir members, please meet in the hallway on the side as we sing. Let us stand. Fairest Lord Jesus.
Thank you. You may be seated.
Thank you, choir. That was beautiful. Tells us the story. The king came, but they crucified him. Even as Pilate had a sign put up that said, King of the Jews. Truly he is King of the Jews and one day he will be the King of all the earth. Book of Revelation and many part, many in the old parts in the Old Testament tell us that he will reign in a millennial kingdom 1,000 years here on this literal earth. A time of perfect righteousness. Boy, have we been waiting for a government that produces perfect righteousness. What a day that will be. Before we begin this morning, uh, let's take time, prepare our hearts for looking into God's holy word, remembering that I am not your teacher. God, the Holy Spirit is your teacher, and if you're grieving the Holy Spirit through sin in your life, he will not. According to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, he is our teacher. Uh, we must confess our sins, be cleansed from all unrighteousness, and the Holy Spirit has the liberty to minister the truth of God's word to your human spirit directly something that no man can do. Uh, so let's take time. We'll pause for silent prayer, and then I'll begin with prayer. Father, we're very thankful to be able to assemble on this first day of the week the day of the week that Jesus rose from the dead. Very important to us, and we do assemble in accordance with your holy word that we should not forsake assembling of ourselves together, that we should come together and take in your word. We should be encouraging one another and lifting up, uh, loving one another, forgiving one another, help carry the burdens of one another. This is the true family of God. May we be that family. Now this morning, as we look into your holy word, may we not only be encouraged by the birth of Jesus Christ, God come down from heaven, but may we be challenged as we get into the part that where he wants we are exhorted to be like Christ incarnate. He, in his human flesh, he lived a holy life, separated from sin and evil and all, and we are exhorted to be Christ-like to be conformed to his image. So may we be challenged this morning and encouraged in the divine enablement that we have to do what you want us to do, Father. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. We're going to talk about his birth. The city of David was Bethlehem. And we're going to look in Luke chapter 2. Last year I put this up. And again, this kind of related to the song in, in a sense. Uh, the prophet Isaiah said in 9.6, for, for, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. And the government will be on his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. 
The son that was given, prophet Isaiah, as often the prophets in the Old Testament did, they jump right to the kingdom. But we know that the, before the kingdom was the cross. That's the valley, as it were. When you look right to the kingdom, down below, sometime in there, was the cross. Probably, they estimate, probably around 4 B.C. was when Jesus was taken outside the walls of Jerusalem, the real city, Jerusalem. There he was crucified, real witnesses, real testimonies. And he became uh, for us the propitiation for our sin. The Father gave his Son to be the offering for our sin. Last week we talked about that. Why was he the only one? Why is Jesus able to say, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. Why was Jesus, some will say, well, how narrow-minded, how arrogant. Jesus came from heaven on the day we're celebrating tomorrow. He took, God took on flesh. God became a man in every sense. Now, I will say, especially for the lesson today, he was also God. 100% God, 100% man. And as we go through the lesson, you'll see a little bit more of that. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. But God... Remember in the garden last week, Jesus pr prayed to his father, Father, if there be any other way than me going to the cross, if there could any other way, let it be. But not my will, but your will. <clears throat> Humanly speaking, Jesus did not want to go to the cross because he already knew. He read about himself in Isaiah 53, written some 700 to 800 years before Jesus was born. And it, it's very descriptive of what was going to happen to him as he was nailed to the cross. And those three hours of darkness, what was going to be happening Essentially, bottom line is, he took all my sin and put it on himself. For the Father put my sin on his Son. He put your sin on his Son. And his Son, as a human being, paid for your sin. There was no other human on earth who was sinless as Jesus was who could bear the sins of the world because he didn't have the sin, any sin of his own. And so this morning, I just want to say before I actually start the lesson, the Bible says, if you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you will be saved. If you believe that he, the Son of God, fully God, fully man, died on the cross, as the Bible says, bore your personal sins so that now he bore them in such a way it's called the propitiation. He bore your sins completely, paid the total price and penalty for our sins, that satisfied the Father's justice because God is perfectly just. He could never forgive me of my sins without Jesus Christ having paid for my sins. And your sins will never be forgiven 
if you don't trust Jesus Christ as your Savior. You will stand one day before Jesus Christ, the one who died for you, having never believed him. And the Bible says very clearly in John 3.18 and 3.36 that the only reason a person will be sent to hell, separated from God for all eternity, is because they would not believe in Jesus Christ. He who believes not is condemned already. That's, like I said with, during announcements, that's an eternal decision we're talking about here. Oh, maybe next week. I'll think about this and maybe next week I'll get to it. Do you know that for sure you're going to be alive next week? If you know that, then I'll say, okay, wait till next week. So, this today is a message about the one who was born to die for me, to die for us, to die for all the world, that every man through faith in Jesus Christ could be saved. And before this service is over and you go out those doors, if you bow your head and to yourself, you don't even have to bow your head. Why did I say that? You don't even have to close your eyes. You don't have to do anything but just say, in your heart. Father, I believe that you love me. You gave your son to die for me. He bore my sins so that I could be forgiven of my sins and I could have eternal life with you and I could have your righteousness and I, can, and I will be in heaven with you. Thank you, Father. Guess what? If you truly trust in that simple statement I just made, not the exact words, they're not magical, just the, the thought, Jesus dying for you, if you do that, you're saved that very moment. Don't be fooled. The world basically thinks, if I'm a good boy all my life, I've got to be good, I've got to do good works, and then maybe my good will weigh more than my bad and maybe God will let me into heaven. Baloney. The Bible says these things are written that you might know that you have eternal life. You can know today that you have eternal life because your faith is completely in Jesus Christ and zero in yourself. So may you trust Christ today. What a day, Christmas Eve, to say, I trusted Christ as my Savior in 2023 on Christmas Eve. When God the Spirit took on flesh, he became the God-man, Jesus Christ. We celebrate his birth, understanding who he is, and understanding what he accomplished for us as I was just speaking about. He accomplished this for all mankind. Every, every man and woman and child on earth can be saved through faith in Jesus Christ. There are no exceptions. The only ones that are not saved are those who do not believe in Jesus Christ. Our time in God's word this morning I have to. Ch I should have changed this. Our time in God's Word this morning has two main sections. One, we're going to look at the account of the birth of Christ, and two, we're going to look at our conformity to Christ in His incarnation. Well, as the lesson grew this week, I decided somewhere like yesterday afternoon that I would cut it off. I couldn't do, in, in 45 minutes, I could not do all that I, it, it just kept growing. 
So uh, we're going to go uh, through the first part. We're going to look at the account of the birth of Christ and some uh, important details and implications from that. And next week, we will uh, be more uh, a lot in line with what Steve was teaching first hour this morning, a Christ likeness, being like the human Jesus who never sinned, being like Christ-like, being like him. I'm not implying that we never sin or we could ever reach sinless perfection. But boy, I'll tell you what, we have all the ammo we need to be what God wants us to be. And when we fall short, we fall short of exercising all the riches in Jesus Christ and the Spirit of God who indwells us. As we begin this morning, if you want to turn in your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 2, verses 14 through 17, we will read. This is a brief summary statement of the incarnation. And if you, oh, there's the title, Conforming to the Incarnate Christ is the title of the message for today and next Sunday. And this gives us a brief summary statement of the incarnation. Hebrews 2.14 says, Inasmuch then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared the same, referring to Christ. Because we were flesh and blood for very many reasons, not very many, but about six reasons, he became flesh. He himself likewise shared in flesh and blood. For indeed, he does not give aid to angels, but he does give aid to the seed of Abraham. That would be those who place their faith in Jesus Christ are called the seed of Abraham. Therefore, in all things, <clears throat> in all things, he had to be made like his brethren, he, Christ, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make the propitiation for the sins of the people. And that's what I was just uh, saying to you. Propitiation essentially, essentially means that he made the full payment for my sin so that God could justly forgive me when I sin. When I confess my sin, he is faithful and just to forgive me of my sins and cleanse me from all unrighteousness because Jesus paid the full price. He is the propitiation for the sins of all mankind. We're going to look uh, now, if you want to turn to Luke chapter 2, uh, the birth of Jesus Christ in Bethlehem. Let's read the first seven verses of Luke 2. And it came to pass in those days that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This census first took place while Quirinius was governing Syria. So all went to be registered, everyone to his own city. Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed wife, who was with child. So it was that while they were there, the days were completed for her to be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. The census, it's just a little uh, neat point, but they had to go to Bethlehem for the census. And the census was to provide data, 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 uh, for uh, tax purposes. 
because they were under the um, rule of Rome. And, uh, you know, think of this. Even with them being under the rule of Rome, they instituted this census. And what did this census do? It brought, G it brought Mary and Joseph right to the town of Bethlehem. And as we just read, it was time for her to deliver the baby. And so she delivered the baby there in a manger, as it were, because there was no room in the inn. And if you look back, if uh, we will look at the verse, but uh, Bethlehem was where the prophet Micah, now prophet Micah prophesied this 700 years before Jesus. That can be shown and dated. And this is what the prophet Micah said. But you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, though you are little amongst, among the thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall come forth to me one to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth are from old, of old, from everlasting. Now, tell me, who is everlasting? <laughs> Only God. God came down and took on human form and the everlasting one was born right in the town that Micah said the everlasting one would be born. Wow, 700 years prior to this. All right, that's, it. that's just exciting. I get all, I get sometimes too excited, but anyway. The genealogies of Matthew and Luke both reveal that Mary and Joseph were descendants of David. So their legal inheritance was in Bethlehem and so the city of David. So that's where they had uh, to go because of their uh, genealogy. And now during this time of census, which was probably a, a, a confined uh, period of time, <clears throat> there were many people in Bethlehem and it was crowded and not any rooms left in the inn. It says in the inn. So we can probably assume there was only one Motel 6 there. And uh, they, all the rooms were taken. And uh, so Mary and Joseph had to lodge in a place where animals were fed and given shelter. And under these conditions, Luke very simply says in verses 6 and 7, so it was while they were there in the days, the days were completed for her to be delivered and she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. This describes the humble beginning that Jesus encountered basically for all of his life. This beginning, this humble beginning foreshadows his life of humility. Then in verses 8 through 20, which we did not read, and I... Um, well, yes, we should read. Okay, if you, if you still have your Bible open to Luke, let's begin in verse 8. <clears throat> so after the account of the birth, in verse 8, now there were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were greatly afraid. Then the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David 
a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be the sign to you. You will find a babe wrapped in swaddling cloths, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. So it was when the angels had gone away from them into heaven then that the shepherds said to one another, Let us now go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has come to pass, which the Lord has made known to us. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. Now when they had seen him, they made widely known the saying which was told them concerning this child. And all those who heard it marveled at those things which were told to them by the shepherds. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. Then the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen as it was told uh, to them. So here we have none other than the announcement of the birth of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, to these shepherds. And they went to see this child who was bound in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. Shepherds were the most likely, unlikely recipients of this revelation. They were rather despised. They were rather a despised class of people. And in religious circles, they were considered ceremonially unclean. They were also thought of as being ignorant. And Dwight Pentecost comments on this and said that God chose them as unprejudiced witnesses to the birth of Christ. End of quote. We can see that a proclamation of such great significance addressed to the entire world wasn't placed in the hand of some important religious people, but rather it was entrusted to shepherds and in that culture, it meant more to them than it means to us because these people were despised. We can see that a proclamation of this significance, the Lord put in their hands, not in what would be considered very educated and important people's hands. And in that regard, we are reminded of what the Apostle Paul said. Notice what he said in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. God, and I edited this just to get the key part. I did no harm to the meaning of the text. God has chosen the things which are despised and the things which are not to bring to nothing the things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. Wow. That's fairly strong. That's the way we ought to be. Not to think anything, not to think highly of ourselves at all. All glory belongs to God. We need to always keep that in mind. Especially when God gifts us with a spiritual gift and he says, now I want you to use this for the profit of all of your church family and you're using your gift and all of a sudden you get puffed up and say, man, am I doing a great job. 
God doesn't want that. So when the glory of the Lord appeared to the shepherds in verse 9, this was the first time in 500 years that the Bible records that the God's glory had appeared again. Well, it goes way back to the tabernacle when the glory of the Lord would appear. And then there's been, they call 400 silent years, but it says here, uh, in the, uh, as I read, 500 years, the glory had not appeared in 500 years. And wouldn't you think, who did the glory appear to? The priest in the tabernacle? No, it appeared to shepherds out in the field ignorant, disdained, unclean. And so we can learn quite a bit from that, I, I believe. It was the birth announcement of none other than Jesus Christ the Lord, the Anointed One, the Messiah, who is the Savior, not of Israel alone, but the Savior of the world. For such a major event, there was a sign. A sign was given. And a sign was giving, given uh, to let them know that something would, this would be something that would let them know that this had really happened and that he was who the angel said he was. And the sign was, you shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling cloths, lying in a manger. And that's exactly what it says. When they came to him, they saw him lying in a manger. And swaddling cloths, by the way, could probably be prophetic. They, in the, the, the wrappings of burial wrappings. Because this baby was headed for the cross to be crucified, to die, and praise God on the third day to rise again. But that was uh, important. And we would think that, hey, this guy, this baby is the king. We would think that he would be born where? In a palace. And he would be dressed how? In royal garments. Royal diapers, if there is such a thing. But not so. He had very humble beginning, and he had a very humble life. That's our Savior. That's our Lord. In the angels' praise to God, they also proclaimed that because of this birth, peace, as we read, uh, peace and goodwill have been extended to the world. In 2.14, it said, Glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace and goodwill toward men. Prophesying of, God, of this baby's provision, of what he was in the future going to provide, that he would reconcile the world to God. Reconcile means to... You know, if you, if you reconcile, if you're at odds with someone, if you're enemies and you reconcile, you come together. And it, we, before I was saved, I was not reconciled to God. I was an enemy, as it were. I was uh, filled with sin. I, w I had a sinful nature and so forth. And once I heard that Jesus Christ died and bore my sins and I placed my faith in Jesus Christ, I then became reconciled to God. I am no longer an enemy. I am a son of God. I am a child of God with a great future. So the shepherds went in haste to find the child, and when they found him, they went from there and made known 
all about the birth of the Christ child. All who heard were amazed when the shepherds brought this news. What? The priest should be bringing this news. Not shepherds, but they, it says they were amazed. So the ignorant, unclean shepherds were able to proclaim the good news that would amaze the hearers. Israel had been waiting for their Messiah King, the Prince of Peace. The Son of God at that time, the Son of God had entered into the realm of humanity. God, listen, became a man. Think about that. God, we know, is three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The Father gave his Son, his Son came to earth, born of the Virgin Mary. And he became a man. John 1.14 says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Referring to Christ. Galatians 4.4 4 says, But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his Son, born of a woman. 1 Timothy 3.16 says, God was manifested in the flesh. In the coming to earth, in coming to earth to fulfill the Father's will, he manifestly became a living example, a living human example of all that God the Father wants us to become. Read that again. Jesus became a living human example of what God the Father wants us to be here on earth, like Jesus here on earth. And we have looked at in weeks prior, we have looked at God's enablement, God's divine enablement through the power of the Spirit, abiding in Christ, um, identifying with the riches of Christ. We, we know that we have divine enablement. When we're not walking according to our sinful flesh, we can be everything God wants us to be. And so don't shake your head and say, oh, this is impossible that I could be like Christ. That's exactly what God wants us to be like. His Son, as He walked this earth, the Son of God became human. He lived a sinless life. And though tempted in every way as we, yet he never sinned once. We're going to talk more about that uh, phrase. His temptations were real just as they Temptations are real to us. When we're tempted to sin, when we're tempted to lie, we're tempted to do this, we're tempted to think that. We're... Jesus had the same temptations, and yet he never sinned once. And I would say that you shouldn't think that, yeah, but he was God. But the Bible clearly says he was human and he was tempted like us. You read Hebrews 4, verse 15. He was tempted in all ways, it said, as us, yet he did not sin. Hebrews 4, 15. So you might be wondering, how did Jesus live over 30 years and he didn't sin once? 
I mean, some of us can say, I can't live more than three minutes in sin. If on a good day, maybe 30. I'm, I'm being silly. On a good day, hopefully you're walking closely with the Lord almost all day long. But we know ourselves. So what's the answer? Well, the answer is pretty much the very things we've been talking about in the prior weeks, but a little different. The answer, I believe, is he lived each day in union with his father. He lived each day in complete dependence upon his father. He lived each day in much prayer, in humility, in desire for his father's will to be done in his life and not his own will. Jesus was not double-minded. He had a single mind and his single focus was to do my father's will. We may be far from that, but that's our goal, to be like Christ. Or we may not be too far from that as we grow in the grace and the knowledge of Jesus Christ and as we trust God and, and we're in prayer almost constantly by divine enablement through the power of the Holy Spirit, the one who indwells us, the third person of the Trinity, we are able to be like Christ. Please, please don't think it's impossible. Understand, take God at his word. Know that it is possible. We just need to make a little heart adjustment. We need to go to the master mechanic, as it were, and said, tweak me, will you please? We need to pray. We need to get on our knees, as it were, and say, God, I want to be like Christ. I want to be like him. I want to walk like he walked. I want your will, not my will. I want to glorify you, not try to glorify myself. I want to trust you more. You see, if you ask God for those things, the Bible says if we ask anything in accordance with his will, he will what? He will hear it and do it. Yes. We need to get before him. Be honest with God. You might as well be. He knows. He knows you better than you know yourself. So I encourage you, as next week we will carry on with this. And I, I'll just end with this. We might well recall, we just studied this, and it's, we've been over this and over this and over this with different teachers we might well recall that when we walk by the power of God's indwelling spirit, we will not sin. Wow. Do you believe that? Do you believe that? Really? For a number of reasons, God became human. And one of those reasons is that we might be encouraged and believe that we can be like him in his humanity because we have been called to be conformed to Jesus Christ. 
to have his mind, to think like he thought, and to live like he lived in complete dependence upon God. When we put ourselves in that position and we, re we want his will and not our will, I'm telling you what, you'll be excited. You'll be excited how God can use you and what he can do with you. And you'll be excited. You'll feel a liberty. You'll feel a relief of dominion under being under the power of sin will be lifted like it was with Jesus Christ. He was tempted in all things, yet he never sinned for over 30 years. And, and I end with this. I said, I, I said that once before, didn't I? Uh, there's a theological discussion out there, a debate about peccability versus impeccability. Being peccable means you're able to sin. Being impeccable means you're not able to sin. I know James chapter 1 verse 13 or 14 says that God is not tempted to sin. But I also know that in Hebrews 4.15 it says that Jesus was tempted in all ways as we are tempted, and I believe this is obviously referring to his humanity, he was tempted in all ways like we were tempted, yet he did not sin, which I take as the possibility that he could have sinned. And you take the Garden of Gethsemane, which I've referred to a number of times in the last two Sundays, where he said, Father, I don't want to go to the cross, but not my will, but your will be done. And the Father essentially said to him, Jesus, there is no other way. There's no other human being here on earth that is the perfect, spotless, sinless Lamb of God like you. That's why you have to go. If all these people that I love can be forgiven, you have to go. And so he went, obviously, we know. But I believe... And I, I, I lean towards believing, I should say it that way, that Jesus could have sinned. I'm not saying that dogmatically, but I think there are many indications that he could have sinned. Otherwise, Hebrews, it sh never should have been written that he was tempted in all ways like us and yet without sin. He was literally tempted. Remember in Matthew chapter 4, when Satan was tempting him to sin before he began his public ministry? Were those temptations real? Yes, those were real temptations. So we have a wonderful example to follow. I end with this. We have a wonderful example to follow, Jesus Christ, the, the, the God-man. And we're looking at his humanity now and his life on earth, the God-man who lived a sinless life. And God wants us to be like him. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you first, you gave your son because you loved us. And the Bible says that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Not when we were good, not when we were lovely, he died for us, but when we were rotten sinners, he died for us. Praise be to you, Father God. And thank you, Jesus, for obeying your Father. And now I pray that you would give us encouragement, you'd give us courage, and hearts that believe your word and what you've said to us in your word, that we can, it is your desire, and we can be conformed to your Son. Not that we're going to ever enter into sinless perfection, but we surely uh, can enter more into the way of righteousness than the way of evil. And we thank you 
uh, for your love and patience. Thank you that you don't give up on us, that you, you hang in there with us, Father. And thank you that you correct us, you discipline us when we need it, and you correct us. May we be attentive to your work in our lives that we might be the children you've called us to be. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Let's turn now in our hymn books to hymn number 600. Face to face with Christ my Savior, we will one day face Jesus Christ who died for us, standing as we sing.